Kosunom, thank you, Budapest. It's an honor to be here with you today and uh, yesterday as well. Uh, and I, actually, just because you're left-handed doesn't mean you can't play the guitar right-handed. You can ask uh, Ryan. He's over there somewhere. Yeah, he actually, he's left-handed but plays guitar right-handed, so he's even cooler. Uh, w- one of the, the cool things uh, as a speaker coming at the end of the conference is that I get to build upon all the other uh, speakers and their awesome talks. And, and so you'll get to hear some of the echoes, perhaps, of some of the things that you've already heard. One of the bad things for me, then, is that you've probably already heard everything that I'm going to be talking about today. And you might also be applying what you've heard from the other speakers to my talk. Like, you might be thinking, uh, is this guy's stories, is it, are they memorable enough? Are they, are they good? But uh, I'm not going to make any excuses. And uh, even though my first story was going to be about uh, thinking outside the box, but uh, no. <laughs> about being a box. Uh, no, actually, uh, so uh, not too long ago, I, I actually started a, a new team, a new job. And I was really excited because the interviews had gone really well and it seemed like we were getting on really well and people were excited to have me be part of the team. And it was all the interviews were done remotely, so I hadn't really actually met uh, my teammates in person. And so it came time for the, our first team event and our, our kind of our, our uh, re- team retreat and planning meeting. So I was really excited to contribute and to be a part of the team and impress my new teammates and show them that I was excited to be there. And so as we were getting into planning and thinking about what we were going to be doing over the next few months, uh, I noticed that the leader of the group pulled up a, a spreadsheet, uh, Excel, on, on the uh, projector and said, all right, let's list all of our tasks and assign everybody to, to do each task. And I was like, well, actually, I have a, a experience and background in, in Kanban and, and visual management systems, and so there's actually another way we might want to do this. It might be more uh, enjoyable. It might be a better way for us to understand our progress and manage our work in progress and see who's doing what. And the team kind of said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And then went right back to doing the Excel spreadsheet planning. And so it's almost like uh, Alf was talking about, you know, sometimes we have ideas, not that that was a particularly innovative idea, but it was something that I felt that I could contribute to my new team. And instead of trying it or at least uh, discussing whether that was, there was merit to that idea, it ended up just kind of being put on the side and ignored. So that got me thinking about what, is it, what does it mean to really contribute to a team? And what does it mean to join a new organization or a new team and feel like you're part of the team and yet also feel like you're able to add who you are and your unique contributions and experience? So I started looking into the idea of culture ad. Uh, we've probably all heard of the idea of culture fit, culture fit interviews. Maybe you've, you've done one of those. Maybe you've been part of one or you've, you've uh, had someone do that. That's really important, but I, I, I'd had that experience and, and yet something was not right in my experience. So that got me thinking about what does it mean to add to culture? So we've probably all, all seen this Peter Drucker statement about the importance of culture. So culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if culture is that important that it, it can eat strategy for breakfast, um, what does that mean to us? I mean, we, we need to think critically about our culture, not only about what our culture is today, but what we want it to be tomorrow. And so it's important that when we acknowledge our culture need not be static, uh, that's okay. Uh, we want to understand, though, and have a serious conversation about what we want our culture to be like. So if you're familiar with the Agile Manifesto, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Agile Mas- Manifesto, and so I tend to think in terms of these, these value statements that have a tension between them, uh, because so often it's not just a either-or kind of a question, but it's really both things are important, but we want to stress one thing over the other. And so my mind went to this, this manifesto type of a approach, and this is value one. I've, I haven't come up with the other ones yet. This is just the first one. So, uh, so the, the way that the Agile Manifesto is constructed is like this. So we are uncovering better ways of, and while they say talking about delivering software, in this place I'm saying we're making people awesome. And by doing it and helping others to do it. And so through this work we have come to value one thing over another. That is to say, culture add 
which is complementing culture, adding more to culture uh, over culture fit. So while there is value in the thing on the right, that is culture fit, we find more value in the thing on the left, which is culture ad. So uh, we like to talk about culture eating strategy for breakfast. I like food. I like pizza. So metaphor for me is pizza, right? So, uh, so if you think about culture fit as adding more of the same thing, uh, more, more pepperoni on the pizza. And by the way, I would eat this pizza. This is, this, I like this, this kind of pizza. Uh, but if we think about culture add, it gives us more options, more variations, more ways to think about problems and solutions. And so if you think about the pizza not only being a bit different and having some optionality, it's also bigger. We have more things to, to choose from, and we can create something bigger. So if you think about the, the pizza on the right there, it's kind of like we heard earlier, we've always done it this way. We're just, we continue to add to what we've always been doing. So like I said, in, in the phrasing of that manifesto value, it means we need both of those things. Just like in the Agile Manifesto, we talk about responding to change over following a plan. We want to have both of those things, but we want to stress one thing over the other. So in terms of looking at culture fit and culture add, so from an organizational goal perspective, the idea of, of culture fit, it's a good thing. We want to preserve some continuity. We're probably already doing some really good things as an organization. And so we don't want to scrap everything and completely start something new. It's really, it's good to have some continuity because if we bring people into our organization and they are completely at odds with what we're trying to do, they have none of the sh same shared values, it's going to be problematic. We're not going to get very far. Similarly, we're thinking about the present when we talk about culture fit. We're thinking about what is our culture today? Uh, and that's how we want to think about new people coming into our organization. The focus is what we have, what's good, what, what can we affirm about who we are, what we do, and our values. And so then, as a, as a bias, a cognitive bias, if you will, then we, we tend to be confirming, a confirmation of what we are and what we want to be. On the other hand, culture add, excuse me, is about creating change, creating change intentionally. And so I'll talk a bit more about what it means to be doing this in a safe way for ourselves so that we do have a, a continuity in our organization still. And so the orientation uh, in terms of our time is looking toward the future. Who do we want to be in the future, not just what we are now? And so that means we have to identify what we're missing. So it's almost like if, you are, if you've done QA work or testing work, you tend to think when you do exploratory testing, you're finding what's not there, uh, as opposed to confirmatory testing, where you're trying to affirm or you're trying to uh, make sure that we have built what we said we would build. Exploratory testing is kind of like the culture ad. And then that biases us toward learning and pushes us toward learning. So something new, it makes us think, what are some new things we can be doing? So it's really important to have both of this, these aspects in our organization. So Diego Rodriguez, who's worked for IDEO, he, he talks about it this way. I don't optimize for fit with our existing culture because over time that will lead to uniformity and irrelevancy. Instead, I try to envision a future where this person's unique point of view has shifted how we work and what we value. I hire for an indiv individual's potential cultural contribution. So has anyone seen this, the, the idea of uh, modern Agile? Josh Kirievsky is kind of updated the Agile Manifesto and, and created this modern Agile. So for me, he uses these, these four points, making people awesome, continuing uh, continuous value delivery, making safety a prerequisite. We heard that earlier today and yesterday. And then the idea of experimentation and learning. So for me, culture ad really pulls at least three of these things together and helps us work on or work toward those, those goals or those, those values. And so when we think about what it means to work safely and have psychological safety so that people can propose new ideas, can be themselves, can help us change our culture, uh, making them awesome and making ourselves awesome, making our customers awesome, and then creating an environment where it's safe for people to experiment, 
That's really about the idea of safe change. And if you're familiar with the word kaizen, uh, is a Japanese word, it means ongoing, continuous improvement. Uh, and then the idea of anzen, which is part of what, uh, what Josh Kurievsky talks about in, in Modern Agile, is the idea of safety. And so I've put those together and created kai anzen. And so you'll note that this is not a real Japanese word. <laughs> Um, it's Matt's idea of a Japanese word. It doesn't really exist. Uh, but it's made of actual Japanese words. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about culture ad and how to do this in a, in a, in a positive, healthy way for our organizations. Similarly, we've, we've heard about this already. I, I told you we'd be kind of covering uh, old ground. But the idea of psychological safety was the number one thing that the Google Aristotle project found in terms of what makes productive, effective, healthy teams. And so their definition is that team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. So if you think back to my story, uh, when I was proposing that idea and trying to make a good impression, trying to show something of my own ability, of my own experience, to help the team, and then it was virtually ignored. Can you imagine how I might have felt about taking another risk to put myself out there the next time? So that reduced my psychological safety. All right, uh, the other things that they, they talk about in the Aristotle Project are the idea of meaning and impact. And I think those two things also relate directly to culture ad, because what we're talking about is a person bringing his whole self or her self to work and contributing and finding meaning in those connections. Making an impact. That's what I wanted to do on my first day. All right, so let's talk about some of the good things. So I already mentioned the idea that it's not an either-or thing. Uh, we want to have culture fit. It's helpful. And so why do we want to do that? So, um, so it's absolutely, absolutely critical that we do have culture fit to an extent. Uh, it's it's uh, oftentimes expressed in a simple interview statement. Do you, how do you feel about our, our values? Or sometimes people ask, would I want to have a beer with this person after work? It's a bit subjective, perhaps. Or would you want to be stuck at the airport with this person? And again, subjective. Uh, but sometimes organizations can actually have helpful listings of their values and, and point to those things as something we want to share. So uh, this actually, uh, this was not planned. These are two of my teammates. We had a, a conference call, and, uh, and we ended up uh, wearing the same shirt that day. So uh, we had to take a picture of it. But, this is an example of, of shared mental models. So if you've read The Fifth Discipline, which is a really helpful book on, on learning organizations, it talks about the importance of shared mental models. And so this is one of the reasons why teams that are together and work together and are similar in lots of ways can actually be very productive. Uh, also, people tend to stay at their job longer if they feel like they're blending in or they're fitting into an organization. You might think about your, your own experience. If you felt out of place, you probably don't want to be there for very long. Um, it also, culture fit doesn't mean hiring people that are all the same either. It can also be positive in the sense that people are working toward the, sh the same shared values. And this is an example of how you can do it in a healthy way. So this is uh, from Atlassian. So they simply shifted their, their focus from the idea of culture fit to values fit. And so that helped them to think more intentionally about what their values were and so it helped them hire people who shared their goals and not necessarily their, their viewpoints or their backgrounds. And so I'm going to talk a lot about the idea of viewpoint diversity. We've, we've talked about this week already about uh, demographic or uh, different kinds of human diversity uh, that is important. But I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different, and that is viewpoint or um, thought diversity. Okay, so speaking of that, so sometimes we can have too much of a good thing. So just a couple examples of when culture fit goes wrong. Uh, so you've, you've seen Facebook in the news, maybe. Uh, Twitter's been in the news for a similar thing. Uh, and there, there's a really powerful statement from one of the senior Facebook engineers. He says, we are a political monoculture that's intolerant of different views. And so this is really important because we tend to see diversity in, in terms of uh, things that we can see, but viewpoint diversity is something that is harder to see or that requires 
a different way of assessing things. And so what happens is when we have too much culture fit, we create a political or a, a viewpoint monoculture such that we really prevent new ideas from coming in and, and even worse, people who have different ideas are made to feel uh, silenced. So if we think about typically the definition of inclusive, inclusivity, we've heard a couple definitions this week, uh, and I propose to you that it's not necessarily about hitting our diversity or our hiring targets. It's really about creating and sustaining uh, an atmosphere or an environment where people are known and they feel known by others and they, they feel that they know other people too. So it's, it's a sort of intimacy and a, a connectedness among your coworkers that does respect different points of view and different uh, backgrounds. So there's a couple other quotes from people in, in Silicon Valley, the idea that we really can, it, this can happen without us even knowing it and even being intentional. It's just because when we have birds of a feather flocking together, we tend to just exclude other points of view. And this can happen in whatever environment you're in, any kind of organization that you're in. And so it doesn't even need to be intentional. It can be unintentional. Uh, here's another example. The idea that we want to be able to speak out and question things, especially when we're working in increasingly complex environments, it's really important that we, are, we have the freedom to talk about things that we might want to question. Uh, part of that is because uh, when we think about innovation or we think about uh, trying new things, experimenting, we need to be able to do that. Okay. So it's easy to mistake rapport with someone or getting on with someone or similar interests. It's easy to mistake that for skill uh, or, or competency in the workplace. Another problem that we can run into when we have too much culture fit, or the idea of a monoculture, is that we become overconfident in our decisions. And so a lot of the research uh, is showing us that the idea of social diversity or viewpoint diversity can actually lead us to better decision making because teams that are diverse with their thought actually are less confident in their decisions. And so they make decisions more carefully. They look at data and details more carefully. Even though those teams are actually less confident than teams that are more aligned or more fit, they actually can come up with, with better solutions because they're more careful. In the worst case, if we exclude any kind of uh, dissent, we might even lead to unethical decisions. So if you Google diversity, you come up with something like this. So lots of nice colors and you know rainbow of, of uh, things going on. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that hiring to create a nice rainbow in our organization is a bad thing. We need to have people from all places in life. We need to think more deeply, though. We need to think beyond just the surface level, and we need to think about what does it mean that we have the possibility of having the same thought even though people are looking different. And so this is one thing we need to think about. This is what I mean when I talk about culture ad. Right, so why would we want to do this? Uh, culture ad, it helps us because it generates fresh ideas and it can invigorate otherwise stagnant environments. And I mentioned the idea that homogenous groups, although they're more confident in their solutions, they can also be, uh, have, have the wrong solutions or not be open to uh, thinking things uh, through more carefully. One, one study showed that organizations uh, that had the same group of people, when they introduced a new person, it was, they were solving a murder mystery, uh, just kind of for fun uh, as a test. But basically, the groups that would, had already worked together and came from the same background were confident in their solutions, and yet when they introduced a new team member, those, those groups actually were able to solve the, uh, the murder mystery more effectively. The other thing is it really boosts our creative power. Having this give and take exchange of, of ideas and being able to freely express ideas actually helps us, again, create more optionality with our ideas. So uh, if you think about my story, and maybe your story too, you are something probably bigger than what your company has hired you for. 
your company has a job description maybe, and they say, we need to find someone who looks like this or can, can fill this, and, and yet you're something more than that. Each of us is an individual. We bring different experiences, different competencies, and it's hard to really tell someone that in the course of even a, a very rigorous interview process. And so the other reality is that the organization, while they might think that they need you for a certain job, maybe the rec says that we need a, a developer, a mobile developer, DevOps person, uh, it's actually what, what they don't see or what they are not thinking about that they actually need you for uh, even more. And so this is that maybe if you think about what Alf introduced us to, the idea of uh, cognitive surplus. What's, what's a person bringing or what are our people bringing us that we're not fully getting out of them, that we're somehow precluding them from using when they come to work for us? So Kaiser Permanente, which is a large healthcare provider organization in the US, uh, they actually had some problems with this, some of their software. And when they found that they, they brought nurses, like frontline nurses, into the decision making about how they were designing the software, it was massively more effective in the design. And that was a simple viewpoint change. They'd been working in a situation where it was just software de de developers uh, and teams, and then they actually extended all the way to their end users and brought them in. And so it's the same reason why we want to have cross-functional teams, cross-functional leadership also, uh, is to be able to bring different points of view uh, to a problem. So if you're familiar with the idea of uh, improv, I think we, someone mentioned it earlier this week, the idea is that we want to say yes and to people. So in improv, you can never say no to someone. You might think it's a crazy idea, uh, but when someone does some action on stage, you need to go with it, and you need to build on that. And so it's a really powerful way to think about our culture and saying, we're saying yes and to whatever someone is bringing. But we need to do that in an effective and a healthy way, and like I said, a safe way. So it's really interesting to be able to be in Hungary and quoting something from a famous Hungarian person named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Is anyone familiar with this? Okay, good, <laughs> all right. Uh, so it's really cool. Uh, he's, I guess, Hungarian-American, so we might be able to claim him just a little bit too, but it's really an honor to be able to talk about his work here uh, with you all today. So he's, he's most known for coming up with this idea of the flow channel or working at our most engaged state, a heightened state of awareness, heightened state of engagement. And so if you think about the idea of our challenge aligning with our competency or our ability to do that thing, that's what really helps us be in that flow channel. And we're working effectively, we're working in such a way that we're not even aware of time, and it feels good, we're always aware of the next goal. That's a really exciting place to be. That's engagement. And there's actually ways to quantify that now, and uh, companies that do engagement surveys uh, help us to understand that in a quantitative way, a measurable way. But I think many new hires and new team members struggle to stay in this, this flow state. Uh, and it's partly because there's a, there's a lack of mutual integration. So organizations typically have a default posture of saying, you come to us and you need to work in our environment and fit into our environment. Yes, you've got some nice skills, but really fundamentally the default posture is that you fit into us, as opposed to we're going to help fit in with you. And so what we have is sometimes this kind of problem, where we have a lack of safety, where it's uh, unsafe to admit failure or to actually fail. Uh, it's unclear what the norms are, uh, what expectations are. And so there's an there's a existing culture, and the new hire needs to not only new, learn the new things of the job, but also understand what's going on in the culture. Feeling unsupported, unknown. This goes back to the idea of feeling known and feeling like people actually know you and what you can bring. And that takes time but I'll talk about ways to do that. And then, in the worst case, unwanted, or feeling like your ideas are unwanted, you're not staffable because uh, people don't really know what you can bring. And there's lots of opportunities. I've, I've talked with uh, colleagues over the years at different places where they feel like because they're, they're having to fit into a box, they need to be a, a business analyst or a tester or a project manager or a developer. And there's opportunities that go by that those people could have actually 
uh, found interesting and added value to, and yet because they didn't fit into a certain box, uh, they weren't thinking outside the box, they just didn't fit into the box, uh, it, was, it was hard for them to be staffed. So people bounce around and then ultimately, in the worst case scenario, they might leave our organization. So we need to think about ways to bring people back into the, the flow channel. And as leaders, as managers, that's one of our chief jobs. And so we heard about the idea of making an environment where people can do good work. And uh, that's part of what this is, is being aware of our colleagues and their state and their, their flow channels. How well do you know your employees and where they are in their flow channel? Uh, you're probably familiar with the idea of the Virginia Satir change model. She came up with this idea, this kind of J curve, uh, where we have some kind of status quo, and then we introduce something, some change, some foreign element, and then it kind of disrupts things a little bit, and then the team figures it out, and then improves, is actually in a better place than it was before. And so the question, though, is what happens once we reach that new status quo? So I would propose to you that culture ad, or intentionally managing for culture ad, allows us to make smaller J-curves and be constantly disrupting ourselves in a small way. And so uh, I think Stephen actually mentioned it earlier today, this idea of uh, the, the Jinko Shrine, which is really fascinating. And they're actually intentionally disrupting themselves every, what is it, 20 years? Uh, that, that's an organizational competency that they've learned as a, as a culture and that we can do as a culture as well uh, in our organizations to be good at changing ourselves, be good at managing safe change. All right, Knevin is another model. I think uh, Michael introduced us to this yesterday, uh, or at least the, the names that we see on this, on this uh, framework. So the idea here is that we want to be thinking about where are we in our domain, in our work? What kind of work are we doing? So some people are doing uh, pipe fitting or, or water pipes, which is more in the ordered domain, so in the obvious or the complicated. So it's kind of like the solution is fairly straightforward. The, the inputs match the outputs fairly easily. And for those things, we have best practices and good practices, right? So it's okay to have kind of knowing what we've always known. You know, this is how we, we make our, our pipes or this is how we do our machines. There's a best way to do that. But for those of us who are working in knowledge work and software delivery, most of our work is new, which is to say it's complex. The inputs only match the outputs, or the cause and effect is only obvious in hindsight or retrospect. It's very hard to predict a lot of what we do in knowledge work because it is new. So as a result, we think about emergent practices. So we don't really have a best practice for something that's new. That's kind of the definition of being new. And so that's even more reason why we need to have lots of different minds, different viewpoints on the problem to understand how we can have these emergent practices. That's also the idea of managing experiments. Because when we're working in a complex environment, we want to poke at the system. We want to get some data because we don't know exactly what we don't know yet. And so that's the idea of probe, sense, and respond, as opposed to just knowing where we are and applying a solution. All right, so I'm gonna just share a few things that I've done in my experience to encourage culture ad. So if you agree that this could be a useful thing, here are some things you might wanna try. So the strengths interview, you've probably heard that, that title uh, and beyond. So I used to lead a coaching practice, so as agile coaches working in software delivery teams. And there were a few of us in the, in the team, this, this coaching practice, and every time we would hire a new coach, we would ask the question, what can this person teach us? So we were very intentional about wanting to expand ourselves and not making ourselves just an echo chamber of coaches. We actually wanted to learn as coaches. And so that required us to have our own psychological safety to say, well, if we hire someone into our group, maybe I'll lose my job or maybe, maybe that person will replace me and I'll be like the, the worst person on the team. We wanted to have enough psychological safety for ourselves that we could take the opportunity to hire people who might have some new ideas and fresh ideas. But then we, it became an expectation. Once that person was hired, it's not just hiring the person, but it's actually building that into your culture. And so it became an expectation then when we hired that person, that new coach, 
to say, teach us. We're excited that you're here. We want to learn from you. And I've actually checked in. Some of my former colleagues are still doing this practice, and they've actually made it even, even a bigger thing where they have every other week one of the coaches, it could be the old coaches or the new ones, they have a, a teach a teach in time right, where they actually share something from the last couple weeks with each other. So it's an intentional building into the culture. So here's some, some things I've collected uh, over the, the past few months about what are some good questions to ask. And so does this person offer a dimension that our culture might be missing? How does, how does this person challenge our thinking and our processes? What kind of viewpoint are we missing? What can we learn from this person? I mentioned that one. And how might this person compliment me? Uh, this is a really good question uh, from my current uh, employer, ThoughtWorks, where we say, don't hire yourself. Uh, and again, that takes a, a level of psychological safety to do. And then where do we want to go? This is that future-facing, future idea of what do we want our culture to be? So there's a, another Japanese word, a concept called ba which is basically a place, and it's specifically a place where knowledge emerges and is contained. So if you think about a team space, hopefully you've worked or you're creating a team space where there's high engagement in terms of people communicating, but also visibility information radiators on the walls. So you can see in the, in the one image on the left, there's a lot of information, whether it's card walls or whether it's just uh, expressions, people with quotes, uh, something that's basically creating a new experience among the team. And so typically when we think about the culture fit interview, it, we, we bias ourselves on similar experiences. So what school did you go to? Oh, I went to that school too. I, I really value this, this person. Or, oh, I went hiking in that same, that same village uh, one, one year. Or I like that same kind of whiskey. Those are, those are good things, but uh, we want to be able to create those shared experiences inside our teams as well. And so we can actually create the culture fit within the context of our team. Not only is it happening in our teams, though, this idea of ba and a place where knowledge exists and resides, but we're also thinking about doing that one-on-one. -on -one. And I think this goes back to the idea of feeling known and knowing other people. It often takes place in the context of one-on-one -on -one relationships. So this is a colleague and me. We, were, we actually were staying in Chicago and our hotel offered boxing lessons. And neither one of us had ever boxed before. I, I'm clearly not a boxer. Uh, so we went for the boxing lesson. And in the course of doing that, we got to know each other a bit more. And so it's about creating space for knowledge, people knowing each other. And that creates safety, that creates trust in a team. But it, it happens on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Another thing I've done with teams and my teammates is this idea of a personal journey map. And so it's, it's really helpful not only for new people, but also people who've been on a team for a while and worked with each other. It can really uh, elucidate people as people. And you can, help, you can understand your colleagues in a new way that you may not have understood them. So this is basically helping people to talk about what their life has been like before they got to this point. And so you can do it as a simple mind map, as this one is like, or uh, like a, a timeline spectrum of ups and downs. But it can be really intimate, getting to know someone's personal story this way. And you can, I don't know if you can tell from the look on these, on these guys' faces, it's actually a really personal thing and a very vulnerable thing to be able to share this with each other in the context of a small team. But it helps us understand the whole person. Uh, here's another example. This is a, uh, one of the things that we're doing at ThoughtWorks. I think this is from our London office. Uh, people pairing up with each other and actually drawing their personal journey. What has your life been like to get to here? And who are you? This is another one. This is called the Market of Skills activity. And so I learned this from a woman named Heidi Helfand, who's in California, not a neighbor of St. Louis, uh, like Kansas City is. So this is an activity you can do with a team or a group even, uh, that's not even necessarily a team, where you create these posters. And you, you do these things that, that are on the, uh, on the slide here. Skills I bring, hobbies, interests. What I want to learn, and what I offer to teach you, and I think these are two of the most important things, is that that starts expanding our horizon, our, our understanding of who people are. And say, so, oh yeah, that person actually might be a good fit for that, that new role. Or maybe not perfectly fit, but has an interest in that, or has taught that in a different domain. That might be something for that person. 
And then you go around the room and you share that and you actually can use stickers or uh, markers to plus one people and really kind of comment on those things about what they're, what they're sharing. And you can put these out. People can peruse them and get to know each other a little bit better. If you're not doing the practice of retrospectives, I encourage you to do this. I invite you to do this. It's really a helpful way to reflect periodically, either uh, every one week or every two weeks sometimes. But it's really a, a looking back to understand how we're working as a team, coupling that with the idea of small experiments. So when you run an experiment as a scientist, you have an hypothesis. And you say, we believe that by doing X, it will result in Y. And we'll know that that's taken place or not by watching Z. And so it's a way to actually quantify your experiments and actually manage those in a safe way. And when you're running small experiments for a week or two weeks, those experiments don't have to be massive. You don't need to worry about a $14 million failure. They can be much smaller scale failures. And so if you think again back to my experience of saying, hey, I have a new idea. I have a suggestion how we might decide to manage our work differently and visualize our work. The team, if we had been practicing retrospectives, we might have said, all right, that's fair. I don't really know what you're talking about, but let's try an experiment and we'll, we'll manage it quantitatively like that. So humans, we have a desire to, to be authentic and we, we need to align ourselves, our internal experiences with our external experiences. So we need other people to see ourselves as we see ourselves. And so the idea of personal identity socialization is an alternative to the typical organizational identity socialization, which is to say, by default, we think, well, you need to come into our organization and become socialized like we are. Uh, and we might present our organization and say, this is how we do things, as opposed to taking a person first uh, approach and saying, who are you? And what do you want to be doing with your, your career? And how might the organization meet you somewhere in between? Uh, this is a, it's called personal best or personal highlight reel, some people call it, where you go around to your teammates or even your family members, you can, you can invite other close friends and family members to say, what is it that you do really well? What is it, when you see Matt working at his best, his personal best, what are those things? So this gives us a perspective outside of ourselves to say, yeah, this, Matt, he's really, he's really excited and, and effective when he's coaching teams or when he's mentoring people or when, when he's sharing his vision and creating a vision for us uh, or doing organizational improvement. That can really guide people to think, well, maybe this person is working a bit outside of his or her role but it's being effective in ways that that person might not have even been hired for. And so this is a really effective way for creating that culture ed. I mentioned Heidi Helfand uh, in the context of the, market, the skills uh, marketplace activity. She's written a book called Dynamic Reteaming. And this idea is that teams change and we might as well get used to doing it well and learn how to do it well. So she talks about the idea of dynamic reteaming. So creating that, that change intentionally, managing it effectively so that people can constantly be working in a state of flow, but teams are always getting a new dose of, of new ideas and not just thinking as a monoculture. The idea of being known in communities. So if you think about the idea of a Dunbar number, so that's the, the highest number of people you can actually have meaningful relationships with. So, uh, whether it's 100, 120, 150 people, that's your village. You might have thousands of Facebook friends, but really you can only have effective relationships with, with around this number. Within that, you might have bands, so groups of uh, smaller people, uh, smaller groups of uh, people around 50, not necessarily smaller people. Uh, and then hunting parties. These are maybe your delivery teams or your, your scrum teams if you work in that context. The two pizza team. And then the smallest number is your, your confidants. And really, this is a place where um, you have the most intimate relationships, people knowing you. And so we need to work as managers and leaders at creating these structures so that people are feeling known. There's research that shows that if you go for uh, more than a couple of months without having a meaningful conversation with someone, you will effectively lose all trust with those people. All right. So. 
in teams I've led, I've, I've done this thing called an autonomy support meeting. So this comes from Daniel Pink's book, Drive, where we were talking about how do we flip the organizational hierarchy such that the manager is now working for the employee. And so I would occasionally get together with the people on my team that I was leading, and I would say, how can I, how can I serve you? What do I need to be doing differently to make you a more effective uh, teammate? And so I can assure you it's, it was much more positive for this guy <laughs> uh, than it looks like on the screen. He's uh, actually, this is after our autonomy support meeting. But basically, it put me in a position where I said, you need to give me homework. I'm not going to give you any homework. Uh, you don't work for me, I work for you. And so this is a way of really intentionally building that in. So to conclude, uh, I'll leave you from a, with a quote from Ed Simon. This is a quote from the book, Fifth Discipline. And particularly the idea of, we must balance our desire for continuity with our desire to be creative. So this goes back to that tension between culture ad and culture fit. We need both. But in order to survive in our organizations today, to be innovative, to be able to work in these complex environments that we're in, we really need to be stressing culture ad. So here's a list of references. I'll have these posted on, online if you want to uh, check these out later. But thank you, Kosanom. And I, think, I don't know if we have time for questions, but thank you. Well, thank you very much. And you're, you're right. It's time for questions. <laughs> okay, great. And we have a couple of questions on the Slido. So the first one is, sure. how can you help a team to accept and learn how to embrace culture and approach? Yeah. So I think pointing out some of these ideas of how, how are we accepting new ideas? How safe do people feel? Uh, you can do a, an engagement survey, actually, to find out exactly how, how safe people are feeling and how engaged they're feeling. But also, just the idea of running small experiments, so trying some things, rotating around the, the team who has the opportunity to propose an experiment, and make them as small as possible. I think that can help. Even like on a daily Yeah, you can, run. yeah, if, if, you, if you can validate your hypothesis in a day, or if you might say, I propose that we do something that's going to take six months. Well, the question might be, can we, can we do that in two weeks, or even better, one day? Okay. Uh, many companies are homogeneously diverse. What do you think about it? Should companies hire people who are against DNI? Yeah. So I, I think it's important to understand, like, what is it? What do people mean by DNI? I think it can be kind of a sledgehammer uh, in terms of like, you need to comply or else, right? And so, helping people understand what we actually mean by it. So I, in my talk, I mentioned the idea of demographic diversity, but there's also the idea of viewpoint diversity or thought diversity. And so first I would say helping people understand what do we mean by that. Uh, and then the idea of homogeneously diverse is kind of interesting. Uh, but I would say what, what, a kind of, what kind of monoculture or blind spots do we have? And is that important to us? Hmm. Okay, so what was the toughest situation you had to face or you had to deal with within an organization? Oh, that's the toughest question. <laughs> I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to uh, take the advantage of one of the other speakers. Uh, I think it was Stephen who said, you can also always say, I don't know. <laughs> maybe give me, take the give courage me, give to say, I don't know. Give me a moment to think know. about it, and I'll, I'll answer it uh, after, the, after the conference. Okay, so what about inclusion over integration, diversity over multiculturality, and power over enable, as the rest of the values for culture manifest? Oh, nice. Uh, thank you. Is it Levente? Levent? Levente. Levente. Uh, I will credit you for that. I like that. Uh, that's really nice. Um, I, I approve. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll do another talk sometime, or maybe Levente will we'll do that talk. Kosanum. <laughs> Okay, and uh, let's, you, let's keep the f sort of fun <laughs> effect. Why did you choose Tim Ferriss for one of your slides? Well, yeah, he, he's written a couple of books, and uh, I think there was like the four-hour work week. Or for, um, so anyway, maybe people aren't as familiar with, with Tim Ferriss, but that was why. Got it. Makes sense. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me hand over to you your cup. All right. And yes, thank you very much. And please uh, go back to Slido now, and you can rate... Matt's speech. Okay, thank you.